coming up on today's Wild West. We'll ride the historic Little Bighorn Battlefield. This is called Mini Kanju Ford. Following the trail of Custer, Crazy Horse, and Sitting Bull. At U.S. Cavalry School, we'll wear the uniform, <laughs> fire the weapons, <laughs> reenact Custer's last stand, and much more. A very special episode of today's Wild West is just ahead. The Wild West. It's still out there. And we'll show you how to find it. This is today's Wild West. Last Stand Hill. A stone marker stands where George Armstrong Custer fell, surrounded by the last of his men in the most legendary battle of the Old West and perhaps all of history. Custer's last stand, the Battle of the Little Bighorn. This quiet summer day belies the horrific violence that took place here on June 25, 1876, when Custer and five companies of his 7th Cavalry, more than 200 men, were cut off, surrounded, and wiped out, with no white survivor to tell the tale. Every June on the anniversary week of that battle, you can ride where Custer rode, camp where the Indian teepees stood, ford the Little Bighorn River in one of the most unique adventures in today's American West. Dress it up! U.S. Cavalry School. Back him up a step. There you go. Hold right there. There is nothing like it. You can't beat it. Being here on the original bloody ground, being on the battlefield itself, it's a, it's a rarity to be able to ride horses on a, a battlefield of this national significance anywhere. No, follow me. Cav School, as it's known for short, is an eight-day immersion into the life of an 1870s U.S. cavalry soldier. Every morning, you'll put on the cavalry uniform attention, and stand at attention as the flag is raised. You'll saddle up your horse with the same McClellan saddle the cavalry rode, ford the Little Bighorn, and ride the Custer battlefield. So to be here on the actual field, that's hard to beat. And you're able to ride a horse, you're able to kind of get the feel, wear the uniforms, get into the sweat of things, experience the heat and the fatigue. It adds a perspective you can't get from a book. As uh, Henry Robert says, you know, the land is the star of our reenactment. It is, it is uh, the star of the show. Keith Heron is the owner and organizer of Cavalry School. In a sense, it's City Slickers meets Last Stand. Cavalry School was actually inspired by the Kevin Costner movie, The Postman. Long story short, the horsemen who portrayed the cavalry in the post-apocalyptic film created the school to teach people about the real U.S. cavalry. And there's no better place to do that than at the site and on the anniversary of history's best-known cavalry battle. The river was red with blood. This was war. It wasn't cowboys and Indians, and it wasn't John Wayne. <laughs> Author and historian Steve Adelson is among the dynamic speakers at Cav School, where you'll learn about the guns, the gear, the saddles, the horses, the politics, and one man's perspective on the final moments on Last Stand Hill. The sky is raining arrows. Gunfire, smoke, yelling, screaming, cursing. But the opportunity to ride where Custer and Crazy Horse rode is what sets Cavalry School apart from any other experience. This is where E Company was routed and they rode as fast as they could to get away and rejoin the other units up on this ridge here. The Little Bighorn Battlefield is immense, stretching for some five miles. Only a small part of that is within the Battlefield National Monument, where riding is severely restricted. The rest of that sacred ground belongs to the real birds. It was actually white bird, but it, 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 it was interpreted as real bird. A prominent Crow Indian family that has long welcomed cavalry school and other visitors to their historic land. Well, it's a long, long story, but I'll make it short. My mother, uh, she says, welcome, welcome the people to this land, because this belongs to the Almighty, and it's, the people should come here if they appreciate it. It's a great honor to be here, and the spirit of the land and of the people and everything that happened is still here. Cavalry school students camp in wall tents right along the banks of the Little Bighorn, 
where the teepees of the vast Indian village stood the day Custer attacked. Just a short trot from camp is the grounds of the annual reenactment of the Custer battle hosted by the real birds that is the culmination of cavalry school. Much more on that later in the program. But to reenact the cavalry, you need horses and the ability to ride them. We'll take you to horsemanship class just ahead. I'm a little more relaxed. I can see that. Horsemanship class at U.S. Cavalry School. Everybody make a little improvement, see something change? Where rookie riders are welcome. While many bring their own horse and gear to Cav School, for those who don't, the school provides the horses, the saddles, uniforms, the training, and everything else you need. This is one of the best places to learn because we're very safe in doing it. We, we have a staff ratio of, uh, of one to one, so that when you're out here, you're with an experienced rider so that you're safe at all times. And the confidence beginners acquire during the week is just one of the school's many benefits. It's changed me as a person because it's giving me far more confidence and courage, and I'm at a later stage in my life. Deborah Richardson was here for her second year of cavalry school. I'm pretty proud of my scar. Despite breaking her wrist when she fell off her horse here the year before. Well, how many people can say that they have a scar? from riding with the 7th Cavalry along the Little Bighorn. As any rider knows, anything can happen when you step on a horse. But well-trained horses and an emphasis on safety go a long way toward minimizing the risk. Lean back a little bit, put your feet forward. I am very particular on the horses that I keep. J.D. Rumsey is among the horse providers for Cav School, supplying mounts that fit everyone from expert riders to beginners. City slicker, if you will. We'll bring them out here, we'll mount them on a horse, we'll teach them everything they need to know from go, all the way to woe. Let's take this one back and I'll grab that other. Okay. That includes learning how to brush, bridle, and saddle a horse. We teach every student that comes to the Calvary School about the care of the animal. We have instructors that walk around, help them the first few times, and then we're standing by waiting for questions as the week goes on and these people get better at what they're doing and more confidence in what they're doing. Got your saddle now. And in the summer heat, it gives you an appreciation for what the soldiers went through. <sighs> but it's a great day. Every day I'm in the cab. Okay, so this is a, uh, it's an original 1859 McClellan tree. Really? Cavalry school students ride only McClellan saddles, the same ones troopers rode in the 1800s. It's a lightweight saddle designed for the comfort of the horse, not the rider. There's no horn, no cushioning, in fact, very little leather at all, but lots of hooks and slots and straps to tie on coats, slickers, and other gear the cavalry depended on. The first time I ever sat in a McClellan saddle was in 2008, and that was when I, I got onto the uh, Fort Carson Mountain Color Guard, and I spent countless hours riding this saddle, and I've actually come to appreciate it for what it is. John Slotten, Army veteran, Montana horseman, and Cav school instructor, often rides his McClellan at home instead of his heavier roping saddle. It's built for to be lightweight. Um, the bars are designed to sit on the horse's back a certain way so that it will lock in place. I To do a demonstration the other day, I loosened my cinch and then, and then got onto the horse um, with the cinch pretty darn loose and the saddle didn't didn't move. So this is the modification, the 72. There's even a class on the evolution of the McClellan taught by Dave Carrico, who provides them for the movies, including the Christian Bale Western, Hostels. Hostels, I had 20 saddles in it. I, I tell people that the authentic saddles are mine, the other saddles are the prop house. Dave makes virtually everything you'd need to outfit both your horse and yourself as an 1870s cavalry soldier. He even brought his store to camp, featuring authentic recreations of period saddlebags, holsters, and cartridge belts. This is a 4550 copper cartridge. I'm going to pass it around. It's a 405 grain soft lead bullet. The detailed history discussions include the cartridges troopers fired from their Springfield carbine. If you left those bullets in a cartridge belt for too long, they developed a green buildup known as verdigris, which would jam your rifle. And since their lives depended on that ammo, few troopers had to be reminded to clean those bullets. The Springfield was a single shot weapon that troopers learned to load in a hurry by keeping their bullets close at hand. Here's what they did. Load, load, 
load. Three extra bullets in your hand. The 4570 was a deadly weapon, far more powerful than the lever action Winchesters and Henrys the Indians acquired. That is, if you hit what you were aiming at. They were definitely shooting high. And we have a whole bunch of hostile testimony that said, yeah, we were sitting there in the top of our teepee poles, we're getting shot out. I mean, you have to shoot pretty high to do that. But the 7th Cavalry had very little target practice, and many of its troopers were very poor shots, especially in the heat of battle. If you look at the amount of training these guys went into going into the 76 campaign, it was minimal, if any. For Americans back east, the shocking defeat of Custer was the 9-11 of its day, and the U.S. military did its best to learn from what happened. You notice into the 1880s, you start to see a progression of a marksmanship program, and they started to become riflemen. Cavalry school includes the opportunity to safely fire live rounds at a target range, and there's equal emphasis on how to safely fire blanks. This is your one and only warning. You point a firearm at anybody, loaded or unloaded, and you are done. Any questions on that? I am deadly serious on that. We'll be shooting lots of blanks during the weekend reenactment, but staying safe with guns is really quite simple. Never point a gun at anything you're not willing to destroy. Keep the firearm unloaded until you're ready to use it. Uh, and keep your finger outside the trigger at all times. Horses need gun training too. Gunfire can of course spook a horse. So we spent an afternoon in the arena with our mounts, teaching them that gunfire tastes good. Okay, you guys ready? Starting on the ground, our officers would fire off a blank and then we'd give our horse a bite of some tasty grain. Very effective training. We've had great success with it. What uh, some people take a month to train, we can do it in just a couple hours. You know, allow us to be safe when we do the reenactment and the other training we do. Okay, hold it. We'll feed. By the end of the session, we were back in the saddle again, each taking a turn firing a weapon horseback. All right, you're, you're the new number one. Yep. You're going to shoot to your right when you're ready, when we're moving. You can take two routes. Forward. Nice, Russ. With our four-legged friends being rewarded after every shot. Get to smell the uh, gunpowder. Get to get used to the powder flash. Want to be near the weapon. At the front. Mark. Meantime, other troopers were practicing daily horseback drills to learn and perfect formation riding, just like the 7th did back in the day. Cavalry units rode single file, in twos, and in combat, operated in groups of four. Troopers would often dismount to fire on foot, with three troopers shooting carbines while the fourth held the horses. That horse holder was a prime target for the Sioux and Cheyenne warriors at the Little Big Horn. No horse meant no chance for a cavalryman stranded on foot. And riding the battlefield, you really see why. There's a reason they call this big sky country. It doesn't get any more wide open than Montana. But the vast rolling prairie is cut with deep coulees and ravines, making it easy for an enemy to hide and impossible for an 1870s soldier to have any idea what lies over the next hill. Which as we learn and practice is why scouting parties were sent out ahead in groups of four, staying in sight of the main body of soldiers and using signals to communicate what they saw. If you got contact with the enemy, you, you circle your horse, okay, and then it, how big of a circle, and if you were doing it at a walk or a trot or a gallop, it would basically tell, tell the commander how close the enemy was to you. Pretty cool to be right where it all happened, though. Yeah, it is. Custer did have Crow Indian scouts, who early on the morning of the battle had tried to warn him of a village so big, its pony herd looked like worms in the grass. But Custer couldn't see what they saw until it was too late. Riding to a hilltop vantage point, we can see what Custer didn't. Mitch Moyer and Curly come running down this direction here towards our north, kind of northeast, and informed Custer that Reno's line had failed. It is surmised at this point is when E and F Company were ordered to attack down Medicine Tail Cooley at Miniconju Ford, which is roughly where our camp is. Custer continued on to on to that ridge there, which is Nye Cartwright or Bluce Ridge. 
and made it all the way as far as Last Stand Hill. What happened in between those points, we don't really know. So it's all guesswork. Horses, of course, played a huge role in the Battle of the Little Bighorn, and they have a memorial of their own just off Last Stand Hill. But what's often overlooked is the condition of the horses. Riding up and down steep hills in the heat of a late June afternoon takes its toll on the animals. Custer and his men had been riding for hours before the battle, and they'd ridden hard the day before. The Indians, when they were attacked, all their war horses were up on these slopes, thousands of them. And they had just mounted them. They were, they were, those horses were fresh. When it comes to the horses, we learn the fight may have been over before it even started. This battle has a lot more to do with horse flesh yes, it does. Than, the, than the historians have put together. And you can't really understand what happened here unless you ride the battlefield horseback. And that's what you're doing. Chance of a lifetime. <laughs> Jeff Reno is related to Major Marcus Reno, Custer's second in command. I'm actually a, a great nephew. Custer split his 7th Cavalry into three groups the day of the battle. He ordered Reno to attack the south end of the Indian village, while Custer swung wide right to attack the village further upstream. Major Reno, would you point out where you made your attack? If you look down toward Gary O and see the, the red building, it would be behind that. As Captain Frederick Benteen was ordered to take the rest of the 7th, including the pack mules carrying extra ammo, and scout far to Reno's left. But Reno and his 140 men were outnumbered and quickly overwhelmed when they attacked the village. Gaul, Crow King, Two Moon, Low Dog, Crazy Horse. They roar out of the village like angry bees out of a hive and smash into Reno. After 20 minutes, Reno collapses in retreat, falls back into the timber along the river. History tells us Reno threw his guns away in a panic as his shattered command fled for their lives, leaving dozens of dead soldiers behind. They took refuge at the top of a steep hill. Unaware that miles away, Custer was in even deeper trouble. The negativity that surrounds Reno is still, is still there. Um, Custer was arrogant. He wasn't bad. He was a fantastic commander, but he was a lucky commander. And he came here, and his luck just finally ran out. Benteen eventually came to Reno's rescue on top of that hill, where the survivors of the 7th had dug in to wait for help, all the while wondering what happened to Custer. That is probably what you would see at the Reno entrenched position. You see a bunch of guys standing around, they're looking, and it's a, a view shed that you can only experience out here on the battlefield. So it kind of, it's kind of a period moment, if you will. Troops just sitting out there waiting, watching, looking up the valley, waiting for the relief to come. It's those kinds of moments that make cavalry school so enlightening, even the history buffs. I thought I knew a lot about the Battle of Little Bighorn growing up. Steve Ramsey is a longtime Civil War reenactor who hauled his horses 2,500 miles to be here, all the way from Maine. When I got here two years ago for the first time, I left with an entire different viewpoint. When you look at it in the movies, it, you know, they got the flat land and it, and it looks completely different, which you envision from the movies than what it really is when you come out here. And then you really start getting involved with uh, saddling horses and training and shooting the authentic uh, era pistols and, and, and carbines. And then you find out that, you know, this is a hard life. While they may be outnumbered, women are, of course, as welcome at Cav School as men. It's been a lot of a lot of fun, very meaningful. You learn a lot of great history. Um, it's been unique. And Brenda Brown believes some women may have even fought in the cavalry, yes. just like they did in the yep. Civil War. I carry with me Civil War reenacting Frances Clayton. Okay. There's 317 documented women that fought in the Civil War. Mm -hmm. So I have to think that there were some women in the Frontier Cavalry at some point. Maybe not, but uh, it's, it's, it's a, a lot of fun. This is a very physical week, and there can be some bumps and bruises along the way. I basically monitor horses and people, make sure that everybody's safe. Diona's been coming here to ride with Cav School for eight years, a place that for her holds a spiritual attraction. The spirit, if you get into it and actually feel the spirit of what's here, both warrior and trooper, it's awesome. And she's not the only one. 
clients to show our job. Yeah, it's, there's a lot of energy out here. Yeah, it's very mystical. There's spirits of the little bighorn, lots of spirits out here. Visiting this sacred ground where men fought and died can be especially meaningful to those who have served in today's military, like John Slotin, wounded in Iraq. I got shot through the lower portion of my jaw and it, the bullet exited out the, uh, behind my left ear. But why would someone who has seen the true horror of war up close want to come here and reenact it? Always loved history. And a lot of our staff and a lot of our, uh, you know, participants are veterans and have seen, you know, the horrors of battle. And there's just something about the, uh, you know, it's, it's more the camaraderie of a military unit that we all miss, but we don't miss the gruesome horrors of, you know, what we've seen over there. Whether the soldier wanted to be there or not, these were soldiers who came to America and they were out serving their country. They, some of them didn't even speak English yet. And they were out defending this country, doing the job that their country asked them to do, and they died in that effort. And they died out here. And so to me, it may sound corny, but it, it has a sense of reverence to it for me. It's like a, going to Arlington Cemetery out here, 210 guys died defending this country for the freedoms that we have today. I'll never, at my age, climb Mount Everest or be one of the lucky astronauts to go to the moon, but I can say that I've ridden pretty much the, the whole trail that Custer rode. Along with the history, the horses, and the comradeship is the sheer beauty of this place. The Little Bighorn River, Montana in summertime. A great place to be. Super. How could I not be doing super out here? I come from the east. You don't have Vista like this. We did have a bit of rain. In fact, more than a bit. But hey, the cavalry rides in all kinds of weather, and the showers just made it easier to appreciate the sunshine. And those beautiful mornings in camp, where we'd savor the scenery and a cup of coffee before the sound of the trumpet called us to the morning flag raising and inspection from General Custer. Good morning, Lieutenant. Cool stuff. For some of the troopers, portraying the seventh is a never ending hobby honoring the man. Like Ron Glasgow, who not only portrays Custer's friend, Lieutenant William Cook, but with his big dungaree-style beard, looks like him too. There's 14 points in his life and my life that match up, so I tend to kind of think that other than the whiskers, I might have some of his spirit and, and uh, some of his enthusiasms and past, share some of the passions that he had too for the uh, 7th Cavalry. And Gary Stewart looks a lot like Custer, I do it because I love history. I have a real passion for history. And the, the Custer's Last Stand battle is such a complex, historically uh, significant battle. There's just so many facets to it that you, you try to try to figure it out and you get more interested and hooked into it every, every time you read something or, or you study it. It's history that appeals to people from all walks of life. I'm here for the fourth fourth time, actually. Fourth time. Swiss native Stefan Neher and his son Fabio returned to Cavalry School for another year from their current home in Singapore. Oh, it's a lot of things. It's, uh, you know, it's a history. You feel, you really feel the history when you're here. It's also the people, the bond you make with the people when you're here and riding the battlefield, the horses. It's, it's so many things. I like to riding and do something with my father. And on top of everything else, cavalry school is simply one great horseback adventure, starting with crossing the Little Bighorn, which we did several times every day. It's not the Missouri, but it's no little creek either. We were instructed to stay focused on the other side of the river because looking down at the rushing water can make your head spin. Go, you two, get up there! And it was always a bit of a thrill to ford that river and to remember those who had been here before, not all that long ago. Our final Sunday in camp, 16 of us crossed the river again to ride to Last Stand Hill on the Little Bighorn National Monument. There we'd participate in ceremonies remembering those who fell here on both sides. Most of the 210 troopers who died with Custer are buried in a common grave at the base of the monument that bears their names. Many of the officers were buried elsewhere. Custer lies at West Point. Inside the nearby visitor center, 
You can see his dress uniform and the buckskins he wore on campaign. There's also a memorial to honor the Indians who died fighting for their freedom and their very way of life. But in the end, it was a losing cause. While the Sioux and Cheyenne won the day, the Little Bighorn would turn out to be their last stand as well. And within a year after the battle, most had surrendered, their free roaming days of the buffalo hunts gone forever. <laughs> but not forgotten. That dramatic history is recreated every year during the reenactment of the Battle of the Little Bighorn. Custer, yellow hair. Hosted by the Real Bird family, calf school troopers and bareback riding Crow Indians stage what is really a great outdoor play about the coming of the white man <laughs> and the clashes that followed. Hundreds of people from all over the country watch this history lesson, written by the Real Birds and told from the Indian point of view. We calf school troopers displayed the formation riding and other skills we'd worked on during the week and put those gun safety lessons to work as well. As we reenact several battle scenes, culminating with the one that everyone has come to see. It's the history of the imperfect people of America, this land we all love, no matter what tribe we come from. And U.S. Cavalry School is part of that story. Oh, I thought they did a really great job. It was super educational. It was awesome, the history. I love when they brought out the horses. I think about what the reenactment is all about, and really it's about telling a story. And it's such a powerful story. And you're contributing to the education and the understanding of, of thousands of folks who know nothing about this. So there's a legacy in essence, and you're passing that legacy on. So when you're out there telling that story, remind yourself of that, because everybody's watching and everybody's learning. That's it for now. We're back next time with more cool stuff from today's Wild West. I'm Mark Bedore. We'll see you down the trail. For more information on the people and places featured in today's Wild West, or to order show DVDs and books, visit todayswildwest.com. Funding for Today's Wild West provided by the Montana Film Commission, the Leggett Foundation, the Chuck Wagon Trail Riders Foundation, the Dude Ranchers Association, and the Dude Ranch Foundation. Mm -hmm.